On today's episode of the Launchpad Podcast, we are talking about a rumored KPJ extension, uh, who we would put around uh, Jalen Green and Jabari Smith if those are the only two guys that stick around during our rebuild, and some potential options for the Rockets to use their salary cap for if they don't get a max player in 2023. So don't go anywhere. We have a great show for y'all today on the Launchpad Podcast. Houston, Roger, we copy and we're standing by for your TV. They throw it up, oh, there goes Jalen Green. Humans can't fly. Rebound picked up by Green, who's back in. Plays it ahead of Moore, back to Green. Oh, and we're tied for Thanksgiving, but there's plenty of yams to go around for Welcome in to another episode of the Launchpad Podcast presented by Clutch the Control Room. As always, I'm your host, Don Knock. You can find me on Twitter at Don Knock. You can find the pod at Clutch City CR. If you go into the description there, there is the Apple Podcast, Spotify, and YouTube links. As always, I am joined by my co host over there, Paolo Owls. Paolo, tell the people where they can find your stuff. What's up, y'all? Y'all can find me on Twitter at Paul Alves NBA. That's P A U L O A L V E S N B A. Everything I do from podcasts like this one to the live shows on Twitter Spaces will find itself linked on there. And Paulo wanted me to explain why I was not here last time. So I have my handy dandy Astros shirt on. I went to the Astros game and I cheered them on as they beat the Yankees on the second end of a doubleheader. So that was very exciting for me. Um, but today we are joined by friend of the show, Finns Rocket. Finns, you're fine addressing you as Finns for this? Sure, Finns. Okay. Uh, my name is Derek. Um, okay. Don't call me Finns, Derek, whatever works for y'all. Okay, perfect. So we're going to go with Finns just for, for flow purposes. Um, we are joined by, like I said, Finns Rocket. Tell the people where they can find your stuff. Sure, guys. Uh, so I, I'm just a Rockets fan. I'm uh, on Twitter at Finns Rocket. Um, I own a business called Open Door Financial Advisors that provides uh, financial planning, counseling, and investment management for middle-class families. Um, and uh, work remotely from home and love the Rockets, man. The Rockets uh, are kind of my my great love besides my university, Texas Tech. So okay. uh, I've, I've been a huge Rockets fan. And going back to being a kid, I remember my, my grandfather – watching uh, the Rockets in the 94, 95 championships, uh, got mad at a play, threw a shoe at the TV. Um, and uh, like I've, I've probably been hooked since then, but really kind of when the Daryl Morey uh, era came along, uh, have followed the team very closely. Uh, you know, my origins go back to, as far as like recent following, uh, like the Scola days. I, I love Scola. Uh, Scola is probably my favorite Rocket. Uh, and uh, just you know, keep up with the team and and try to figure out what they're thinking um, before they think it, which we know is near impossible to do, but still it's fun to do as a fan. Yeah. So my mom also a Texas Tech grad. So there you go. We got, we got awesome. a little connection going there. Um, there you go. So today we have a great show for you guys. We're going to be talking a little bit about the recently rumored KPJ extension. We're going to talk about. Just a hypothetical, sorry, friend of the show, Roosh Williams. Uh, you know, you can tune out for the second segment. We're going to do a little bit of a hypothetical. Um, you know, if Jalen Green and Jabari Smith are the only two guys that are still around after the Rockets finish the rebuild, what would you want to surround those guys with in terms of players uh, and archetypes, things like that? And then in the final segment, we're going to talk about um, what the Rockets can do with their salary cap space in 2023 if they don't get a max salary guy in that slot. So, you know, a lot of interesting things there for sure. But to start out with, let's look at the KPJ extension. So this dropped yesterday. Um, was it Eco? Uh, it was Shams. It was Shams? Okay. So probably yeah, from Eco, funneled to Shams, but Shams, Shams got it, so we'll give him the credit. Um, you know, just mentioned that the Rockets are, you know, have broached a contract extension talk with Kevin Porter Jr. Obviously, on this pod, we've mentioned that you know the expectation probably was that KPJ will hit restricted free agency, go out, test the market, see what kind of deal he can get, and then bring that back to the Rockets, and then they'll make a decision on whether they are going to match or not. But you know, coming into free agency, 
I think most people expected Jay Sean Tate to get, or at least ask for a little bit larger of a deal than he got. And so now I think the the general pulse around the fan base is, you know, if you can get Kevin Porter Jr. for something around what Colin Sexton is rumored to be offered from the Cleveland Cavaliers, you know, from that 12 to 15 million dollar range, maybe with the option on the last year, I think a lot of people would be um, comfortable with that type of deal. You know, a little bit of an underpay, try to get him earlier in the cycle. Uh, and then, you know, prevent him, you know, it only takes one team to sign a guy to a big offer sheet. And, you know, I think a lot of people may not think that Kevin Porter Jr. is going to get some type of crazy offer sheet next year. But if he does have, you know, just a huge breakout year with no mistakes and no no off the court incidents, you never know. It could definitely happen. So, Finns, I'm going to go to you first because Paulo loves to talk. Uh, I'll go to you first. How are you feeling about a potential KPJ extension this offseason? And then how would you feel if they don't get anything done um, about letting him go into free agency and, and trying to get deal the Rockets to match that way? Yeah, I, I think I'm fine either way. Um, you know, if you do an extension, it's it's got to make sense for the team. Um, and if you go into free agency, then, you know, you're leaving your options open. So you're kind of keeping your powder dry. I mean, there's there's still a lot of potential scenarios that can play out next summer i mean you've got scoot henderson out there which people are calling a generational talent um you've got a ton of open cap space that you could go use on someone like jordan Poole, um and then you've got kpj and so you know when i look at that i think well i actually could support the idea of of extending kpj but it's got to make sense it's got to fit within a certain framework for the team to where they don't feel like they're overextending themselves and they're still keeping their options open. And uh, they feel like, you know, they can reposition KPJ's role within the team if it doesn't work or if it doesn't work out or if you get a guy that you feel like is just a better fit. So that that's kind of the way that I think about KPJ. It's not a like for sure, no, don't do an extension. It's a, if it makes sense for the team and if the number is right, then I, I, I think it makes sense. Um, and and you know, really, we've got to think in terms of like where we are in the cycle to me. And we're still early. I mean, we're really only a, a year and a half or so into this rebuild. And so, you know, realistically, Jalen Green, Jabari, those guys are probably at best three to four years away from like their contention years. And so I, I still feel like we're in risk taking mode. And even if KPJ is uh, viewed as a risk, then I, that's one that I'm still willing to take. Again, so long as you don't feel like you're extending yourself on the cap. Yeah, to me, to me it comes down to, it's as you said, the, the game is you can pay him right now, and as long as it's, it's cheap enough, you're kind of betting on if he gets, if he has a breakout season, he's going to get a massive offer sheet from someone. Uh, it won't, a, a good season with no off the court problems won't make everybody forget about his past, but teams in the NBA will often take the risk on talent, uh, regardless of how a guy looks off the court, unless it's a a Miles Bridges type of situation, which it clearly isn't, right? So you're basically you want to pay him earlier on because you you would want to sign an extension because you'd be saving money when the actual extension kicks in. That's that's the main goal, right? And so then you have to take into consideration the likelihoods. How likely is it that he becomes a star and then we've got a massive bargain? How likely, how likely is it that he is a sixth man? And in that case, a certain price point is more appropriate. If he becomes a 3 and D wing that, that with some plus passing or whatever, then that's a, another different price point, right? And as people have said, people on Twitter usually like are somewhere the most negative fans or the, the least confident fans, I'll call it that way, are more on the 10 to 12 million range. And then the, the people that trust them more are on the 13 through 16 million dollar range. And then the people that are really, really confident in them are in the 17 through 20 range, right? And I think I, I don't think anybody is kind of advocating to give them more. And so to me, I have, I can see two positions. I, I would be willing to give him a three-year deal where he makes $15 million a season, which is, I think, by the time the, that extension starts, it's like 11 or 12% of the cap, which is not a lot of money. Uh, with, and it's important to look at it that way, because while $15 million 
looks like a lot in the past three years in the league, when the contract actually kicks in, what matters is how, how much of a percentage of, of the cap space is that, because that's how you value players. It's if you've got to have it related to what your what uh, the luxury tax is, which is usually what team what I assume Tillman looks at as the as the the spending limit. Um, and so I, I'm willing to go three years at 50 million a year, which is three years 45 million for those who like to look at contracts that way. Um, I think that allows you to. That's basically what I think will be fair money for a six man or a three and D wing in the league by then. Uh, depending on the quality of the six man, Eric Gordon is making more than that, and his contract was signed three or four years ago, uh, or his extension was, I think, three years ago. <laughs> and so that's fair money on the kind of lower end of outcomes. And if he does blow up, that's an absolute bargain. And if he does blow up, then you'd want that bargain to last for longer, right? And so because of that, there's another alternative that I have that I really like, which is pay him a little bit more money per year, but in exchange of doing that, uh, in exchange for doing that, get a little bit more of team control. Uh, for example, instead of paying him $15 million a year for three years, what if you pay them 17 or $18 million or, or 20 with some incentives for four years, but you make the fourth year team option, for example, right? You gain an extra year that if he blows, if he blows up and he's like the soup, this the star, right? Then you will get another year of team control, which is always good. If he doesn't, you're still kind of protected in the sense that, well, while you're paying him a little bit more money over the first three years, you also get the flexibility of not not needing to pick up that option at the end. Um, I think there's a lot of little caveats that you can add to it you can make the incentives based on games played and so the entire scenario where he just get falls out of the league because of, of edited concerns goes at least cuts a little bit onto what the punishment would be for giving him a contract you could make it tied to performance you could make it tied to wins if you wanted to knowing that the rockets will try and win on the, on the season that the contract would kick in so there's a lot of little things that you can add to it they said i'm willing to give him up to 15 million a year if, if it's a short contract for three years if he's if he's okay with giving up more team control i might go a little bit higher to increase the potential value of the contract um if he does break out which i believe he has every he has all the tools to do so i just you know it's always scary with a guy with the problems that he's had to give him a really, a really long contract and I think yeah, Paolo, me, I really like how you I like how you framed that um, because I, I think that's exactly the way to think about it is if you you what you want is a contract that benefits the team now right obviously is able to pay KPJ keep him keep him on the team but then incentivize it I, I really like that idea and you could see something like you know so my number is something like four years fifty to sixty million so I'm probably around the twelve million or so per year. 12 to 13 and a half million or so per year. And, but I, I would be open to the idea of say, like, let's do base of 12 and then let's put like $3 million bonuses on each year um, and then make it a team option on the last year. And you can, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting what teams can tie in because the, the, there's not as much constraints around bonuses. So they can get pretty creative about like the kind of things that they can put into the bonus. Um, as far as making sure that KPJ is, is you know, playing for the team and that he's focused on, on the court, um, what's going on. So I, I love that idea. And I think we're roughly kind of in the same area. And I, I think we're thinking about the right way. You know, to me, it's like I want multiple shots at superstars. That's what I want. I just I want to take as many shots as I possibly can at it. And I think Jalen's one. I think Ben... Uh, no, I was about to say Ben Carroll. <laughs> I'm still, right, I'm still in shock over there. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm a huge Jabari fan, but but uh, I got so used to the Ben Carroll stuff that I was like, okay, Ben Carroll. But um, Jabari, I think, is going to be one. And, you know, KPJ, maybe. And I'm okay with saying, you know, hey, let's give this, let's give this run another, like, three years or so and just see, see what happens and, like, take another shot. This team has got so much flexibility. We have zero bad contracts now. 
there's no reason not to take another risk. And, you know, KPJ was basically just handed to us. I mean, the Cavs, I, you know, just whatever happened over there, whether he burnt some bridges, the Cavs burnt some bridges, you know, it just it wasn't working over there. And we basically get the benefit of a free shot at a superstar. And I want to continue looking at that and seeing if it's legitimate because the things that KPJ has are just things that you can't teach. I mean, he's he's got a like huge wingspan. He's like six five six. I think he's almost six six now. Just looking at him on the court, um, like he's athletic, crazy athletic. You know, he's a smart guy. He's he's really creative with his dribble. You know, he's a guy that can move the ball around the court. I mean, it's just. That it's really hard to find guys like that. And in your point earlier, it's like, uh, to me, there's not much middle ground here. It's like either I find a value deal on KPJ or I want to keep my powder dry. And so, like, I, I want a value deal with KPJ with the, with the opportunity of hitting a home run, right? But I don't want to do anything that's going to impede my ability to take another shot in free agency, either in 2023 or 2024. And so, I, ooh, let me stop you right there. Um, I'm, I have a list of all of the guards that make in between 12, five and 15 million right here. It's just so we can see who's in this range for, you know, point of comparison. Right. So yeah. um, at 12, five, you have Kelly Oubre, Josh Hart, Gar uh, Gary Harris, Patrick Beverly, Jordan Clarkson. Um, that's between 12, five and 13, uh, 13, five. And then at 14, you have KCP, Luke Kennard, Kevin Herter, Derek Rose, Derek White. So those are the type yeah. of players that you're getting for that price range, right? And none of those guys mm -hmm. that you really see and think, oh, you know, that's someone who's just making you, you don't think of those, oh, that's a max guy. This guy making tons of money, yeah. right? Most of those guys are on, you know, pretty reasonable deals. And I think, you know, to Paul's point earlier, right? Um, 15 million does sound like a lot. Uh, and even even the Eric Gordon contract, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, you know, Eric Gordon's just on this crazy contract, but he's on like what 20, like 19 or 20. Um, you know, in today's money, that's actually not that large of a deal. And there's a lot of contracts we said around that that range. Um, I guess and is it is a little bit lower than Gordon's, right? The 15 is a little bit lower. You can work a lot more in there. Um, the MLE being like 10 gets you pretty close to that 12 to 15 anyway. I mean, but the MLE itself in two years, the MLE will probably be 11.5. And so yeah. you pay, you're paying him three and a half million over the MLE for a 23 year old guy who you think has star potential. Mm -hmm. Just you know, seems. And then I want to talk a little bit more on the incentives part because there's creative ways to do it. And in specific for KPJ, which is a guy that you have no, I mean, you have some doubts, but not exacerbating doubts about his on-court production. You can tie incentives to winning games. You can tie, which is important if you were trying to make a push for the play -in. perfect, incentivize him to play basketball to win games. Mm -hmm. uh, and playing in games is important for the case that he just, you know, for some reason falls out of the league, then that's a little bit less of a of a hit yeah. you take for his contract. I like, one, one that I like is when you have an incentive that's tied to both three-point percentage and three-point volume. Because usually if you tie to three-point percentage, there's there's been cases in the past of guys that get to a percentage and then never take a three again because they're afraid of dropping it back down and they don't want to lose that money. When you tie yeah. it to a volume, not per game, but totally in a season, that makes it so a guy has to take threes up until that volume before he even is even considering getting that bonus. But he's also not wanting to just chuck up shots because you're, you want, you're walking him into... A, per a percentage from three as well. That's one that I like as well, especially for KPJ, a guy that takes a lot of step back sometimes, and you can kind of reel him a little bit back with that, depending on what you're wanting out of him. Um, yeah, and you know, too, uh, with that, if you tie, especially if you tie it to wins. So, and you know, I'm not Bima. I'm like, uh, if Bima is the assistant to the GM, I'm like the assistant to the assistant to the GM. Um, but as, as I recall, when you tie incentives into a contract how that counts against the, the cap is whether it's likely or unlikely okay yes. so if the incentive is unlikely which wins would be unlikely um <laughs> then it's not going to count against the cap and you're kind of still keeping your your powder dry again like yeah. there's just there's a lot of creative ways to do this without going to the like let's max kpj you know like we don't have to go all that way and i think for kpj's purposes you know I could see him thinking, look, I, I need to lock up some money now. 
Um, like a lot of these guys, if they're not sure they're going to get their that max contract out there, then they're willing to come to the table and talk to you. And I, I think that might happen with KPJ. And it, it does seem like from kind of some of the recent news releases that that's out there. Yeah, like, like I mentioned earlier, right? That's what happened basically with Jay Sean Tate, right? He went for a deal that most people would say was under what they anticipate he was going to get. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and so just to, to touch on a little bit of what Finn said, the um, the likely versus unlikely, the way that's determined for those who might not be familiar is if the player achieved that the year before, then it's considered likely, and it counts towards the cap as if his salary were the, his base salary plus that bonus. Mm -hmm. If he didn't achieve that the year before, then it counts as unlikely, and you get that cap space. Uh, there's some changes to this when. Uh, this is when it's about the cap and about trades. When it comes to the tax, usually I think they always count as likely for some reason. Just so in case if the guy achieves it, you, uh, achieves it, you, you know, you can't go over the hard cap because of it. So you know how how that stuff usually works. And then the other thing is for KPJ, as Finn said, right? We're only looking at it from the rocket standpoint. For KPJ, a, a deal that's three years long is actually kind of perfect for him because. In one year, no matter what he does, he won't be able to completely delete um, his past from everybody's mind around the league, right? Yeah. But in three years, if he can hold it together for three years, then he goes into the free agency, the free agency market as a 26-year-old. So he's still, in the years of his prime, he can easily get a four-year contract that takes him to 30 and nobody has a problem giving a 26-year-old a, a max deal if they deem him worthy or display worthy. And it gives them a little bit more time to prove everybody that he is uh, matured. Uh, he will also get older, and so you would assume that he's mature as well. And in the meantime, it's not as much of an all or nothing kind of thing. He locks in. He's made, I think, $8 million so far in his career. He was the 30th pick in the draft. So he, he's, his rookie salary is actually not that much money for NBA terms. He, yeah. on a, let's call it my deal, on the 45 million for three years uh, contract, that's already 5.6 times what he's made thus far in his career over the next three years. That basically he's basically fine from there on out. It's not one of those things where uh, you only got your rookie deal and then you, you were out of the league. That brings some financial security that I'm sure he'd like to have while also giving him the possibility to still aim for a max contract eventually if his play backs it up um absolutely and, absolutely yeah, and, and, and you know look at 26 27 year old uh if he's playing like that if he's playing like an all nba type player yeah he's he's going to get a max contract whether that's from the rockets or someone else so i, I mean kpj is young i mean he's oh he uh, someone posted what was it uh kpj is the same age or is younger than Keegan Murray. Murray. yeah it's just insane right it's insane to he's think about for that. so long uh, yeah, He's and I'm actually, so I'm going to make a prediction here, a, a call, okay? And I, I'm making this call because I know I suffer zero consequences for making this call. <laughs> well, we're going to write this down and put the a KPJ reminder KPJ contract, if, if we lock in KPJ on a really good deal, has the potential to be the Steph Curry contract for the Houston Rockets. The Steph Curry contract is what set up them building the super team, okay? So it was, they identified Steph Curry Right, he was he was awesome shooter, but he had all those injury concerns on the front in the front end of his rookie deal, right? And that's what caused him to sign a below market deal, and it was I think a four year extension at about like eleven million dollars per. Because of that, that allowed them to build out that team in a way that created the super team, right? And I think KPJ's contract, just because he has so much upside like that, and it's it's not upside that's just ethereal and like out there. We've seen it. We've seen it actually on the court. And so it's just a matter of can he put it all together for a season? If he does that and the Rockets have him locked up for 12 to 15 million a year, that contract has the potential to be the Steph Curry contract of the Houston Rockets. And that, yeah. that Steph Curry contract was $11 million a year in old cap money. So it would be yeah. fairly comparable. To Roughly 15. same. Yeah. 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 And uh, KPJ also had a lot of ankle injuries last year. Not as bad as Steph Curry, but you know, we yeah. saw him roll his ankle a, a number of times. So some people and, have attributed that to his not being able to finish at the rim as well um, last season. Thing, so another thing that people talk about is they don't want to compromise cap space next year. And to that, I, I say, 
we have 70 million dollars in cap space next year we are more we'll get into this one in one of the further in, in i think the last segment we're likely not going to be using all that money to bring players in um and even if we did if you sign him at the top end of Finn's range at 15 million you're only paying him six million uh, for 5.4 millions more million more than his actual cap hold is so you're actually practically unless you don't plan on bringing him back whatsoever you're only losing five million dollars in cap space in a 70 million dollar amount of cap that you have so it's really if you think that that can that you could get him on a low on, on a bargain deal with some potential right it's a risk versus reward thing the risk is actually not that big because even if he completely flops which i think is really unlikely considering the tools that he has and that he was the best catch and shoot three-point shooter in the league and when you can shoot really well you usually have a spot in the league even if you're a little bit overpaid three yeah. years a three-year contract is not the end of the world. like jay sean tate had a three-year contract when he came in he's going into his last year this year and it seems like he's been here like such a short amount of time three years is nothing in yeah. the nba yeah and 15 million dollars when the cap is projected to be, uh, I mean, I could I can look at it, but I think it's projected to be like like 130 by the time he takes that contract. Like that's 10, 11, 12 percent of the cap. Like that's almost nothing, right? It's not it's not as big of a risk as I as I I think people are giving it credit for. Versus the risk, and it, it ultimately it will depend on how much you trust KPJ. Rashford would, at the very least, be a be an be a, a a good role player off the bench in the worst case scenario. And when you look at it that way, if he's if if the reports coming out that he, that they are in negotiations, when the entire off season, all the reports always said they are not in negotiations, they're going to wait until next year. Something something changed, and the only thing that makes sense to have changed is on KPJ side because the Rockets are fine. <laughs> the, the circumstances have not changed for the Rockets. The only thing that yeah. changed is a guy like Colin Sexton, who KPJ knows very well, who was on his team in in Cleveland, just found out that because a big question mark, which is his injury, his injury, or for KPJ would be his uh, his mental uh, attitude issues. The dude is still a free agent, and how long ago this free agency start? A really good player, a guy that averaged 24 and, and 5, I think, two years ago on good and on excellent efficiency. I think like that three guy, weeks ago for free agency start. It was like yeah, three weeks. that guy does not have a contract, and it's rumored yeah. that he's being offered, I think, 12 million a year for three years for a guy that averaged 25 points per game as a 22 year old two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that makes. KPJ's agency think and 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 look at it like, hey, maybe we should go back to negotiation to the negotiation table and take maybe a short term deal that guarantees us a little bit more money and we can still hit the market if everything goes goes right, yeah. while he's still young. So I think the rumor, the fact that a guy as reputable as Shams is talking about it means that something changed, and that if something changes, probably on KPJ side, which is good for us in our quest to give him a a a bargain deal. Yeah. All right, so this is a good stopping point. We're going to run to break real quick. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, how we would build around Jabari and Jalen if those are the only two guys remaining uh, from this core after we finish the rebuild. So that KPJ contract we just signed him to, you, throw it out the window, and we'll, we'll tackle this little hypothetical when we come back. And continuing our second segment here on the Launchpad Podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about a super fun hypothetical so we're going to assume that Jabari and Jalen are the two foundational pieces that remain from this rebuild. Um, everyone else on the roster is going to get shuffled shuffled around. No one that else is on the roster, no one else that is on the roster currently is going to be here for this exercise. So just Jalen, just Jabari. Who would you put around them? What type of players, what type of archetypes would you put around them uh, to maximize their skill set? And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna let one of y'all go first, Finns. If you want to take this one first again, um, you, you feel free. But I just want to point one thing out before we start this exercise. Um, you know, if we had drafted Paolo Bancaro, I think this would be a, a lot different of an exercise, just because of you know the archetype that he is and and how he would mesh with Jalen and stuff like that. But I really think you know, if we'll get into this a little bit more specifically uh, on who the players and stuff like that are, but. I think Jalen and Jabari are two guys that are pretty easy to build around. 
So I think yeah. that's kind of the starting point to this is where you can really be pretty creative, pretty, you know, innovative with how you want to build around them. Um, you know, different players, different archetypes like that. So uh, Finn's we'll let you go first. Uh, this was your brainchild question. And, and then Paula will go to you after that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for this question, I have to say goodbye to my beloved Singoon. Um, I, I love Singoon, but uh, I, we don't we don't know what we don't know yet in some ways. Um, and, you know, it, just looking at this team and, and there's so much interesting talent on it and we have to play out. But in reality, we really only know two players right now that we're pretty sure are part of this core. It's, it's Jabari and it's Jalen. And, you know, what's great and you kind of laid it out. What's great about these two guys is on offense, their roles are extremely well defined. Like we know exactly what we want them to do on offense, right? So with Jalen, he's your score. He's your get a bucket guy. He's he's your three level scorer. He puts pressure on the defense in all kinds of different ways. He doesn't have to just be on ball. He can play off ball. And I think that was kind of an adjustment for a lot of us as Rockets fans. You know, like we we started out with Harden and we're like, okay, how do we find the next Harden? And KPJ comes along. And he looks exactly like Harden, right? He plays exactly like Harden, and we're, we're thinking a little, ourselves, little skinnier, okay, like skinnier, a little skinnier, but but other than that, yeah, like Harden. yeah, like a skinny, more athletic Harden. I, I hate saying that, but but anyway, so he's, you know, he's just di- totally different type of player, and so we're we're seeing this play out throughout the season, and then you know, he's that bl- huge blow up, um, in the last like what was it like 15, 20 games just went absolutely insane. And you're seeing who he is, right? He's just this alpha type score. And so it's so easy. And because he's not a guy that demands to have the ball at all times, it's so easy then to map people around him and to like figure out, okay, what does, what does he need to make him the best player that he can be? And then Jabari on offense, again, we're talking offense here for Jabari, like Jabari's floor is this amazing like stretch five stretch four uh like crazy contested shooting three-point shooter that excels from the wings which is the hardest place to shoot from right that's why gordon is so valuable gordon's not just valuable because he's a good three-point shooter gordon's valuable because he can step out to 28 feet and hit a shot from the wings right from the left to right wing and so like guys that can do that kind of thing just add an insane amount of value, take that and now put it in a like 610 frame that like has a high release point. And it's now like, how do you even begin to guard that, right? Because there's so many versatile ways that you can use him. I mean, maybe he is more than that. And I believe he is more than that. I, I think he is more than just a guy who stretches the floor for you. But even if that's all he is, man, it, it's just, that's a tremendous piece to have on this team. And as others pointed out, that's not a piece that other teams have. Um, I love Evan Mobley. I think he's like a very talented defender, um, but he doesn't have that spacing component in his game yet. And so, you know, like to basically get a guy who I think is not exactly the same defender as Evan Mobley, but to get a guy that has that kind of potential in many ways and to give him like a a legitimate three-point shot is just insane, right? And, you know, who knows, maybe those elbow jumpers become something, you know, maybe he's able to be a guy that, you know, you're in, you're in a playoff game and the coverage is really tight and you can throw it down to him on the, like on the left post or on the left elbow and he can go to work and he can do some like turnaround jumpers and that kind of thing. Maybe he will be that guy, but I don't know that yet. Right. What I do know is the guy's just a tremendous three point shooter. And I don't think there's any questions about that right now. So you start with that and you just think, okay, you've got guys that have very well-defined offensive roles. And then add on top of that, that they are both extremely versatile defenders. Okay. And I, I know we like to point to Jabari is easy to point to and say, he's a very versatile defender, right? Because we, he looks like a guy who can at least guard three through five. Maybe he can get down to one and twos as well. Right. But Jalen is not like a small shooting guard. He's not that at all. I mean, he's still a little slight of frame, but that's going to build out over time. I'm not concerned about that at all. Um, he's a, he's a good size shooting guard. He's six, five. I think he's got like a six, nine wingspan. Um, the guy's got insane vertical. 
Like you're not worried about the athleticism at all with either of these guys on the defensive side. So they're both very versatile defenders, which just means like there's so many different ways that you can bring in another player and map those two guys around them, right? And, you know, like we've talked about with Ben Caro, it was just, it was a different discussion, right? And it's not that I like Ben Caro. I think he's a very talented player. It's just that it was going to take a different type of person to put around him, right? With Jabari and with Jalen, like those are just guys that they have the size, they have the length, they have the athleticism. You know, maybe they're not all there right now, but we're not, we don't care about where they are right now. We care about where they're going to be three or four years from now. And it just gives you so many paths. So, Having said all of that, to me, you know, if, if I were going to like optimize this and say like, man, who, who or what could we get that would make this basically like the perfect core three, right? And to me, it would be a playmaking engine style small forward. Okay. Th that's, that's who like I would want. If I were going to go out and find a guy that like would just, like completely fit into what those two guys need and what they like, what you could do on a playoff roster with a guy, a three, a small forward that could play make, right. Then, I mean, this, there's no limits to this roster, right? Because what's great about a three playmaker is that they can't be played off the floor. They can't be played off the floor in the, in the playoffs, right? So long as they're a quality defender, like they're still out there during crunch time, there, this is not like, you know, the guy's too small. He can't guard like bigger players. Like, it's not like that. You can find that perfect small forward then that can play make with those two guys. Then it's perfect. And then like, if you've got that guy, then like you can play around with the point guard and center. Like maybe the center that you go get is more of like a rim protector. Maybe it's more of a Singoon type that can be like a secondary playmaker because you know that you've got Jabari that can step into the five right? Um, when you're in that like last five minutes. And then at, at point guard, maybe you go for more of like a wing type player, right? Which is why I'm not against, which is why I like KPJ, right? Because he can play more like a wing type player. So um, I love the idea of getting like a playmaking three. And, and I'll have like a list of names of guys that I'm thinking about. But those were my like initial thoughts as I was thinking about Jabari and Jalen. Yeah, I think I, I I echo a lot of a lot of what, the same things that you said. I think people, uh, me myself included, were were on Salas's ass the entire season because we I personally didn't quite get how he was developing guys, and I still think that a lot of what these guys developed is due to their own ability. But one thing that he deserves credit for, and that will be really important as the team moves forward, is he is the guy that instilled in Jalen this: you've got to, you're not only going to play off the ball, you're going to be really really good off the ball and we saw yeah. Kevin Green talk about the uh, I think it was Windows that he called them uh, um, that in the sense that when he's off the ball he's constantly moving constantly trying to find the optimal spot to be to have the most amount of space possible and when you have the most amount of space possible and Sky is athletic as Kevin is as big of a, as good as yeah. a, of a first step as he does and if he is to become the 39% shooter from three that he was ever since January onwards last season, then it's insanely deadly because you have to respect the three-point shot because he's a really good shooter, but he's also got the first, the best or second best first step in the league. And so it's yeah. truly unguardable if he's a really good off-the-ball player. And like I a remember... rumored 51-inch vertical. I mean, the, the guy is <laughs> yeah. just insane. And so that's why I compared a little bit of his play style, not his actual play yet. So we take a grain of salt to his play style. I compared that a little bit with a fusion of what Steph Curry does and what Zach Levine does. In the sense that Curry likes to move off the ball a bunch, gets a little ton of uh, open threes because he knows where to be, where to go. And Zach Levine, because of the insane athleticism and the ability to just pull up into a shot at any point on the floor, especially knowing what he did in the mid range. So Kevin is this guy that can is basically built in a lap, be a co-star, that can also take over. Um, and play on the ball when needed. And then Jabari, Jabari is just the ultimate off-ball player. Insane shooter, insane length, insane defense, one through five. This guy will fit at any position next to anybody in the entire league. It's literally impossible to, you, you could not find a scenario where Jabari Smith is not a perfect fit on a team. And so what this means is to me, you need at least one more 
a primary level initiator. Whether that is a point guard, which I think it's easier to find in this league, or a wing, who is, a, who is probably the ideal scenario, but it's a little bit harder to find a, a LeBron yeah. type in the sense of a, a, a ball dominant wing, a Kawhi Leonard works as well, um, Jason Tatum, mm-hmm. Paul George, a guy like that. Or, you mentioned the name. I'll tell you. You mentioned the name. <laughs> uh, or um, you could. It could even be Shengun. It could be a playmaking uh, hub center. Or it could even be a guy like Paolo Banquero in the, in the, in a world where you slide Jabari to yeah. the five or you slide Jabari to the three, and you got a, a Banquero or a Siakam type of guy that can be your offensive engine out of the four as well. Uh, they're so versatile they can they can play up and down positions. I also think that there's a world where you can plug a ball dominant, hardened type shooting guard in, and Dylan is so shifty. I think Dylan, at least early on in his career, will will actually be better defending point guards than he will be his shooting guards because he's so quick, and he's not as strong as he needs to be yet. So I think he it's possible that he'll get bullied by by some shooting guards. But he'll be perfectly fine defending point guard. So I, I even think it's both perfectly possible if you bring a shooting guard that's more of a combo guard that can play make as a primary playmaker like a James Harden back when, when he was in his prime. Then I think Kevin can perfectly defensively slot to the one and defend the quicker guards and you can protect a little bit of that. Uh, more combo guard, you know, usually a little bit worse on defense with Kevin at the one. Um, yeah. And so... This to say, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, and it was, you guys know I was a Vaquero guy. A lot of my, I guess, coping mechanism was just looking at it and thinking, hey, next year's draft is stacked with on the ball talent. And so, us getting Kibari might end up, to me, me before the draft, becoming as a blessing in disguise. In the sense yeah. that, well, now, if you have Vaquero, Amen Thompson, Alstar Thompson, Nick Smith, Sc- uh, Scoot Henderson, mm-hmm. Derek Whitehead, all of these guys that need the ball in their hands, all of a sudden are a little bit worse of a fit. And you really don't care that much about fit, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to win the year after, you do care about fit. Um, and so any of these guys will fit perfectly into into this team, into any of the roles that we've listed so far. And to me, that that's the, the most beautiful thing. And I think when you're looking to add prime talent, it's easier to add on-ball players than off-ball players when you're looking at max-type guys. Um, and so we know that it's become less likely to acquire a max guy through free agency. But even through trade, um, if we're if it starts disgruntled, it will most likely be a non-ball star. And so I think and it, we are literally in a situation where at the 1, at the 2, at the 3, at the 4, or at the 5, we can just plug and play any star and these guys are so versatile that they can shift the position up or down and and still you know have optimal team building from there on out and then once you get that star i my philosophy is 3d guys all over the court um yeah. if if it's not a center the center doesn't have to be 3d but at least has to be a rim runner if it can be a mouse turner type perfect but at the very least yeah. it can capella type and then if it's a, if it's a wing star then a Pat, Patrick Beverly or Tyrese Halliburton type of point guard. If it's a star point guard, then a Robert Covington, Mikael Bridges step as well. Yeah. So I think when I'm doing this exercise, right, I think there's like there's two swing skills for either or for each guy that I'm kind of watching in terms of you know how I would want to carry out this rebuild, right? And so for Jalen, um, it would be his playmaking. And then his defense, right? And y'all both touched on those two things a little bit. But you know, if, if Jalen can make a, a leap, right, where he can get to, we'll say, like DeMar DeRozan level of playmaker, right? Then you can run Jalen kind of more as that combo guard that Paulo was alluding to. And then, you know, maybe you can bring in, you know, someone who's more specifically three and D. Um, or maybe a little bit less of a primary creator like Finns was alluding to at the three. Yeah. Um just again, drop the defense. name. We, we know who you want to say. Drop the name. Drop the name. Are you talking about Jalen Brown? Of course. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I've been pushing Jalen Browns for a couple months now, but uh, <laughs> Jalen Brown definitely be a, a guy I'd be interested in. But Jalen um, Brown's on the list. He's on he the list. He is definitely on the list. But yeah, so yeah. You know, if, if, if Jalen Green. Like you've made the list gif. I don't know if, if anybody if Jaylen will get that Green, right, If Jalen Green can develop in those two categories, right? And you can kind of play him as yeah. like. Kind of like the 
not necessarily the idealized version of, but you know, what people kind of want KPJ to be right now, right? Where it's like this guy that has some level of passing distribution, but is mostly a scorer. Um, and then obviously, you know, the the big trade off there is you know you're not worried about Jalen with the off the court stuff, so you know you can just really let the talent uh, kind of pull yeah. up uh, in in him there. But for Jabari, the two things that I'm interested in are more so if he can play up a position. Um, we saw them do that a little bit in summer league, but they, I saw him try to run pick and roll a couple times, and it didn't look that great. And mm-hmm. you know, to be fair, like that's not something he is he needs to or expected to you know come in and yeah. be able to do right away. But if you can run pick and roll with Jabari, right, you can really use him as that small ball five because he already has the pick and pop down. We know that that's you know yeah. locked in. Teams are going to buy on that every time. But if you can run pick and roll with him as well, and then use him a little bit as you know, a little bit of a vertical spacer, or at least, you know, someone that can get downhill. And then he does mm-hmm. have some level of passing that he can do on the short roll, right? So uh, yeah. that's a function you can play with him at um, there as well. But if you can kind of slide those guys a little bit out, so maybe push them, push Jalen to like a one, two, and Jabbar's like a four, five, then, you know, I think there's a lot of flexibility. We mentioned Jalen Brown. Um, he's someone who, you know, comes in with a lot of exciting tools that would pair with those guys if you want to kind of deploy them that way um yeah. if if jabari couldn't become a center you know when well, i say full time but you know a large percentage of the time then i really become interested in uh some of the guys that paulo kind of alluded to rim runner type someone miles turner I, I think is he's a little bit more he has a little bit more rim protection but he's not really giving you that vertical spacing element that you're not getting with jabari already so i think it's not super redundant but you know, there might be a little bit of redundancy there. Um, you know, someone like Clint Capella, I think that would have been a few years ago. That, yeah. been, that would have been an interesting pair with, with well, those two guys. Clint, Clint's exactly who I would have picked for someone like Ben Caro. I, yeah. I, I think that's exactly who I think you would have slotted in at the five with Ben Caro. It's going to be uh, next year, and it's going to be Derek <laughs> Lively. And, you know, another guy, maybe, you know, DeAndre Ayton, right, where he has some level of scoring potential, some level of defense. You know, the motor with Ayton may be a little bit in question, but, you know, the mm-hmm. tools-wise, tools, uh, tools wise, you can definitely see how he fits there. Um, you know, if, if Jalen can't slide down, then I think it does open me up to – I won't say necessarily Harden level combo guards, but, you know, at least someone that is a little bit more – pass not pass first but a little bit more of a natural playmaker um maybe yeah. a natural combo combo guy um you mean Luka Doncic once he requests this right right I mean Luka Doncic obviously would be an incredible player to have if we could get our hands on him but uh yeah. I mean I was thinking usually the guys if you just kind of look at it the guys that end up kind of cycling around or they're on a team and it's like, oh they can't win on this team they start doing the shuffle it, it's usually scoring point guards and a lot of teams want scoring point guards, especially ones oh, that have so like a little bit Morant, more. I got you. Just gonna keep Rock, dropping names. Noble Rockets <laughs> fan John Morant. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, if we could get John Morant, absolutely. I mean, I am not hesitating to do that. But yeah, I mean, someone like that would be incredible. I was thinking Lillard. Yeah. Obviously, Lillard's yeah. a little bit aged out, and I think the defense with Lillard's a little suspect. But if you have four guys at other positions that are all really plus defenders, um, yeah. then I think you know it makes. It makes hiding one guy a little bit easier. And, you know, you're going to expect that Jabari and Jalen are going to be, if not, you know, in Jabari's case, super elite defenders. You know, you hope Jalen's at least becoming a plus defender. So that gives you a little bit more um, leeway at one position. But and those are the type of names I, I was thinking about. Yeah, definitely. If we could get John Morant, I'm not hesitating there. Um, Tyrese yeah. Halliburton, I, that's a name I like as well. I don't know if, what his availability is going to be. And, you know, even um, the guy that the Boston Celtics just picked up, um Malcolm Brogdon I think that's a pretty good archetype of a guy that I would like to see play along Jalen you know kind of no matter what happens he's a guy that's you know very good feel very good um game I'll say game manager but just doesn't make a ton of mistakes the scoring isn't crazy but you know a little bit of defense and a little bit of passing and playmaking uh knows how to play really within himself so uh those are the type of guys I'm interested in and like I said it really does depend on those swing skills for me I think if you if you're just kind of like freezing them in time um, where they are now, just skill development wise, if they, you know, just get better at what they're good at now and aren't really adding those other swing skill elements to their game, then I think yeah. it does make sense to bring in a little bit more of a, a playmaker 
Um, yeah. Definitely, like what Finn said with the three, I think that would be ideal. Or if not, a, a playmaking point guard. And then I think the center. I, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna say you know you need to bring in uh, Jokic or, or Anthony Davis or someone really aggressive like that. I think you can kind of get away with being a little bit more of a wing based team, um, yeah. especially the way that the NBA is right now. Yeah, and, and so and y'all mentioned like several names that I would have on my list as well. Um, when I'm thinking about centers, uh, honestly, I just don't know right now. I, I don't know exactly. Um, I, I'm still, I, I know the, for the purpose of all this, we're not including Sagoon, but I just, I want to see what he becomes, right? Before I jump to the, okay, let's just get a rim protector, right? Because if we decide to do the, let's just do a rim protector, that's fine. Um, that's nothing wrong with it. That's one of the easiest guys to find. Um, it's one of the cheapest, easiest guys to find. You don't need to go blow high draft picks on it. You can find a guy that was like, you know, went through his rookie contract and he was overpaid in his second deal and he's halfway through it and the team doesn't want him anymore. Like you, you can find guys like that all the time. And so I'm, I'm just generally not worried about like, go find that guy now and figure it out. I'd rather see, okay, what could Sengum become over the next couple of years and, and then go from there. But my guy, like the, the number one guy, um, and Paulo is probably going to laugh at me because um, he's basically the mirror. He's like the, the small forward version of Ben Caro is Jason Tatum. Um, Jason Tatum is basically the perfect fit on this team on, on a variety of different levels. Um, he's, he's more three to, to Paulo's four, um, but like he's just, he's a perfect fit within that. And I think, you know, some of what happens because when people hear a name like that, they think, ah, oh, whatever, you know, just Rockets fans like losing their minds, right? Um, look, the, the NBA is a short term league now. It's a, it's a, what have you done for me recently, right? And there's a reason why Boston is talking to the Nets right now. And it's because Jason uh, Tatum is a free agent in three years, and Jalen Brown is a free agent in two years. And that is much shorter in NBA time frames than the Rockets are right now. The Rockets are in like eight year time frames because you've got Jalen for another eight and you've got Jabari for another nine, assuming they get max extensions. So like there's there's no, for the Rockets in, like you can be patient and wait for anything. To That's also why I don't think we should be just casually throwing around draft picks. Um, I wanna sit on those and wait for a guy like that, for a team to blow up that nobody's like calling for right now it just happened and people are already forgetting about it. like i see people throwing the the phoenix suns offer uh to uh the brooklyn nets which is very likely like basically the duration of all their picks and they're like oh why would we want all that we just saw that you know like we're seeing that playing out in real time we're the beneficiaries of it so we of course know but it's like every single one of them Every single instance of trades like that has blown up on on the team making the trades faces. I mean, the Lakers, the Lakers, and the Pels are going to get some really good picks in the Lakers over the next over the next three years. The Thunder are yeah. going to get some really good picks from the Clippers. They yeah. already they already got number twelve last year. Yeah. The um, the the Pelicans. The only one that hasn't actually blown up is probably the the Drew Holiday trade, and we we and we still have some more years to see if that how that works out. But yeah, I think I think the big them. takeaway from this podcast up to this point is that we are preying on the Celtics' downfall. Celtics, yes. Nets, all of them. <laughs> Lakers, just because we don't like them. If you but, have a superstar, um, we're preying on your downfall. <laughs> Mavericks, and get get them in there too. I mean that one. That one is just just comes with being a Rockets fan. Warriors, I Jazz. Yeah. Where are you getting from? Some, the some people are born dude. haters, baby. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Um, but I I don't know. We don't, I don't know about the da- Jazz right now because if they send Mitchell out of there, they may out tank us. And uh, I don't know. They could fumble Wimby, but yeah, the Spurs. The Spurs are that's it's, a team that could definitely out tank us. No, it's scripted. The Spurs are getting wavy. It's way too scripted. It's so obvious now. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it's not. Tim Duncan 2.0, dude. All right. Any final thoughts on this thing? We've gone a little long once again. I'm good. Everyone good? All right. So when we come back, we are going to hopefully briefly discuss some salary cap options that the Rockets have in 2023 if they do not bring in one of these super exciting max players that we just talked about in this segment. So We'll be right back, and we'll get to that in just one moment. All right, and we are back. So 
we're going to talk a little bit about some of the options that the Rockets may have in free agency if they do not secure a max level player. Um, already right now, you know, the trend around the league seems to be that guys that are going to be free agents tend to just resign and then force a trade. We've seen that, you know, numerous times uh, in recent past. Kevin Durant's forcing a trade on, <laughs> I think, a four-year deal remaining. So, yeah. you know, these contracts basically mean nothing now. But obviously for the players, the contract, you know, they want to lock that in. Going into free agency, I think there's kind of two ways to look at this. You know, if you're, you're going to want to do something with that salary cap, right? Um, so you could try to sign short-term deals that expire, or you could try to sign deals that are going to continue to be movable when one of these players, like we mentioned in the previous segment, come available so you can have that salary to match sending back, kind of like what the Lakers did um, in the Russell Westbrook trade, right, where they sent you know these – spare parts over for Westbrook. Obviously Westbrook was a little bit of a depreciating asset at that time and you know didn't command, you know, just a mega haul, but you just structurally that's how you, you want to kind of think of the the stair stepping with the contracts of piecing those together. Mm-hmm. So Paolo, we're going to go to you first this time. Finn's got to go first the last two times. You know, do you have any contingency plans in place if the Rockets don't get uh James Harden or uh, another free agent coming back in 2023? Yeah, I actually think it's the 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 wide majority of outcomes is that they spent they spent some of that money bringing in high level role players to low level role players to just vets with that money, be it on long term deals if they're on the younger side, or on one plus one deals and opening up the cap space again the year afterwards. Combination of that with taking some bad contracts for picks, um, and that sometimes to people sounds like tanking. It really isn't like that i think there's there's two examples there's the the hawks who had some cap space before Trey young got a massive extension and they used it on gallinari and uh bogdanovich shooting guard one not the the jazz one and so that's kind of what you're looking to do with some of your cap space but the hawks didn't have the amount of cap space that the rockets did the rockets do and the free agency uh period that the hawks were in was actually worse than the one this year, if you all remember, it was the, the AD offseason when, when he re-signed with the Lakers. There was basically, I think, there was basically no one in that, in that class. It was it was really, really bad. And they still managed to bring in two, two decent role players. But I think the Rockets don't have 40 million cap space. They have 70. And so I think uh, a part of it will definitely be taking on a bad contract with one or two years left for... Uh, from a team that has to extend someone or a team that has a rookie that's hit his last year and his extension is going to come in. And so and they want to get back down over a massive tax bill, for example. The example I bring is a team that you take on the salary dump and you'd get an asset for it, but it would you would still get a half-decent player. It's not like a completely washed, you know, Evan Turner type of thing. It's yeah. a... My first suggestion, I guess, is uh, Gordon Hayward from the Hornets, which yeah. was which seemed more realistic when they were going to max Miles Bridges. So I don't really know if it's still a thing, but they will be after next year. They'll have to pay Lamelo Ball, and so that's going to be a max contract. Um, and I, they probably would want, uh, you know. They're not really a tax-paying team usually, and so they're likely not going to want to be paying tax over over even even when Lamelo Ball is there. And with Ball there, with Lamelo Ball there, Gordon Hayward's kind of overlapping in the sense that he's this kind of he's kind of a washed-up version of the playmaking wing that we were talking about mm-hmm. uh, in the segment before. And so mm-hmm. he would be, I think, a good vet since he is a vet. He's uh, he's a past All Star. I think he's th- he'll be 32 by then. He is injury prone, but then again, you're taking it at a salary dump, so you're getting assets with him. And he's actually someone who can contribute on the court with his playmaking, with his facilitating. Um, I'm actually really interested in that. I, He's a really good fit. He can shoot. He's, um, you know, he's not going to take the ball out of the young guy's hands. He's not a, like a superstar guy. It, it just adds uh, to really good things a guy that can contribute a guy that has experience a guy that doesn't 
isn't ball dominant while not being good enough to be ball dominant. I'm looking at your Russ. And you were you were taking you're probably getting an asset or two with him. Which is good yeah. because as much as the, we like to think that the Rockets are overloaded with assets, yeah. by the start of next season, the Rockets will have at the same amount of draft picks that a normal team, if you insert a new team into the NBA, that they would have. They'll have one per year, which is what's normal. But it's not. Yeah. They've spent a lot of the plus draft capital, draft capital that they had, they spent it already. It was Garuba, Josh Christopher, um, Two of them went to Shangun, Tari East, and Tai Tai Washington. You know, yeah. they are already players. And so when it comes to actual draft picks, we're not that far ahead. We're not ahead. We won't be ahead at all of what a normal NBA what a normal NBA team has. And so you'd want to have some picks that are not your own, besides the Nets ones, that you can just throw in trades and not feel super bad about it because you never know what's going to happen with the franchise. We just saw that with James Harden. So it's good to have some picks from other franchises that you can move just for role players that fit. Um, yeah. I, we would have thank, thanked a lot of... We would have kept a lot of players that we might have wanted to keep if we had picks like that during the Harden years of contending where we were just trading our own draft picks and we could have traded... If we had a couple of extra picks, we probably wouldn't need to give up our entire future for Russell Westbrook, for example. Yeah, yeah. And Gordon Hayward was the guy that I had, like, number one for the salary dump. So just to kind of get a lay of the land, someone posted, maybe Clutch posted about this. Like, if you add up, like, our top 11 prospects, all of their salary adds up to, like, less than what uh, John Wall is making. So, like, we've just got all this talent concentrated in this, like, huge pool of players um and it gives us a lot of versatility and it, it's going to mean that we'll probably have something like 70 million dollars worth of cap room to play around with and it perhaps we could i mean if we said buy the tape then uh, we would open up more space so there's we, we even from there we still have more versatility because we just don't have any really negative contracts on the books so Gordon Hayward was, yeah, my number one. He was my number one for like the salary dump. And, and I've roughly thought of it as like the way that I would do this, and it varies depending on how free agency plays out, but I would kind of dedicate half of that 70 million or so to try to bring in players and half of it to taking back salary for future assets, right? And I think that's a good use of capital, but I, I can see why it would vary depending on like, who's available, what plays out, all that kind of stuff. So it, just to get like the, the guys out of the way that we're not talking about here, my max guys for 2023 are Jordan Poole and Chris Middleton. Okay, so those are the two guys that I would offer max contracts to. And I know, I know some people are going to like, oh, what are you talking about? But like the Chris Middleton one, um, the guy is like a, uh, he's, he's, he's almost alpha in plain sight. Um, he's not, and I know he's like a one B, but he's a guy that would fit in perfectly to this team. Um, and everyone thinks in terms of like, Hey, you've got to have guys that perfect that line up with like your contention. And I understand that is true. Okay. But you also have to have guys that like get you into contending like role, right. That get you into that. And I just, you know, he's a guy that went to Texas A&M. So, like, he's familiar with Texas. Like, a lot of guys, like, around here are going to know who he is. Um, he's, you know, just, uh, he's a perfect role player. He's also a creator. He averaged, like, four assists per, per game last year. Um, like, he's just, he's a versatile guy. And then Jordan Poole, I know that's uh, one, but, man, like, the guy's just got a ton of moxie. And he might be that, like, James Harden, like, the guy that looks like a six-man but is actually like a, a star right and he just he needs to bloom into a bigger role and if 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 i'm the rockets and if i'm stone i am calling jordan Poole's agent you know with through a secret number right because you don't want them to track it back to you but <laughs> like, i'm extension. calling his agent and say hey i've got a max contract on the table for you like just hold on you know wait okay so and again i mean this is kind of contingent on kpj and all this other stuff but Jordan Poole would be a guy. So those two we're kind of not really looking at. Like some of the other guys that I would take a look at are Wiggins. 
So Andrew Wiggins is a guy I would take a look at. So we're just going to poach someone from Golden State? <laughs> yeah, we're going to like figure it out, Golden State, because one of them's leaving. Um, <laughs> Harrison Barnes is probably a guy I would take a look at. Um, these are guys that you're not going to have to pay max contracts to. They are going to command something that's decent, but not like it's it's not going to blow up your future cap. Um, as far as centers, I would take a look at Miles Turner. I would take a, uh, uh, a look at Jakob Pertl. Um, I think Jakob would be a really good fit if you're thinking more in terms of like a rim protector um, and a guy who just has played in that like open uh, San Antonio system. Um, I think those would be guys that I would take a look at. What about LeBron James, dude? For... LeBron James, yeah. No, He's a that's free not... agent. <laughs> yeah, but, but honestly, what I'm trying to do is like, I just want stars. Now, I think Jordan Poole is a, is a potential star, okay? So like, to me, that's worth a gamble. But if it's not a star, then I want to keep things like, I just want to keep my options open for 2024 because in 2024, look at this list here. Okay. These are your free agents in 2024 and tell me like this would not be perfect. Kawhi Leonard, Jalen Brown, OG Anunobi, Herb Jones is a restricted free agent. <laughs> It's like future Hall of Famer Herb Jones. Herb Jones. Now, okay, I get it with Herb Jones, but like I'm just saying, like you're gonna have all of these like options. And I'm not calling Herb Jones a superstar. That's not what I'm doing. Okay, I like Herb Jones. I'm just I'm not calling a superstar. I'm just saying like no, I'm I'm calling a superstar. No, you don't have you're to. calling I'm a superstar. Calling a superstar. Yeah, no way. Like, especially those first three: Kawhi, Jalen, OG Anunoby. Like, man. I would love to have those guys on this roster at a cost of nothing other than cap space, right? Cam Johnson is that as well. I love Cam Johnson. Cam Johnson's out there. Yeah, I mean, he would be a good kind of role player type. So, like, if, if I could, like, map a perfect way for the next two off seasons to play out, because we really have two off seasons left of, like, open free cap to make our big move. If I were to map it out perfectly from my perspective, it would be Jordan Poole in this and then taking back Jordan Gordon Hayward um, with a salary dump Wait. and pick. Wait, Cam Clemson is not next year, it's not in 2024, it's actually next year, it's just, wow. Is he 2023? Was... Yeah, I didn't wow. know that. Well, that's an okay. I'm thinking I'm, I'm walking into. <laughs> and then Gordon Hayward's salary rolls off and then you go get either Jalen Brown, okay, or you make it, or a Kawhi Leonard or OG Onanobi, or you make a trade for uh, Jason Tatum. That that's to me, if I were going to map out like a perfect outcome for the next couple of years, get me Jordan Poole and Jason Tatum. That would be it. I love me some Jason Tatum, dude. What am I All right. In the league? All right. So we are up against the hard out we have here. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up real quick. So. You can find me on Twitter at Don Knock. You can find the pod at Clutch DCR. In the description there, there's the link tree with the YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast links. You can find Paulo at Paulo Alves, NBA. Everything he does on Twitter will find its way there. Uh, and then you can find our new friend of the show, Finn's Rocket, on Twitter at Finn's Rocket. So until next time, y'all, be safe and go Rockets. <laughs>